I wanted to ask each of you, and uh, maybe I'll start with you, Michael. Um, what was when when what was going on in your in your life in your studio uh, when you made uh, uh, every story has two sides? How did it arise? Well, actually, uh, uh, there's no activity in my studio. It's mostly storage. Uh, my activities are seem to center around emails. Uh, what about when you made uh, in 1974? Was that was the film made in your studio? Well, I mean, there there there, there is some recent work, but but uh, but uh, like the the, uh, <coughs> the viewing of six new works, which is a video installation, mm -hmm. six simultaneous projections. Okay. I think that's probably the new, the newest thing the newest. That, I, okay. that I've done. Okay. But actually, you mentioned a number of the of public uh, works that I've done, mm -hmm. and w the most recent one really is on the Trump Building at Bay in Adelaide, mm -hmm. uh, and it has nothing to do with Mr. Trump. <laughs> but uh, I, I finished the programming for it. Uh, if you haven't seen it, it's on every night. But it's a it's a sixty uh, story line of activated light do, doing all kinds of different things. Okay, I've heard I've heard it's it's uh, very excellent. So it, it's really in a sense my new my newest, newest work piece. because even, even though uh, I, it, it was prepared about. Uh, yeah, about almost three years ago, for various reasons, it wasn't possible to, to, to make it work until recently. Okay. So anyway, uh, uh, that, that's that's my that's I guess that's my newest work. Okay. What about two sides to every story? Well, two what was sides happening? Was, the, was that shot in your studio? It, it was done. Uh, two sides to every story. Mm -hmm. No, I think you can see it's, uh, well, actually it was shot in the Isaacs Gallery when it used okay. to be on Young Street. On Young Street, Street. yeah. Yeah, because it's, uh, there is, uh, it's definitely a street scene. The, it yeah. was shot at night and you yeah. can see the, the car lights go by. Can you speak uh. up a little bit more or speak more into your mic? Sorry? sorry? Yeah, speak more into the mic. I oh, think. okay. Yeah. And, and also, I should probably try to say something more interesting than I have been. <laughs> <laughs> I'll try again. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll speak uh, loud. Speak no. loud right into the mic. Yeah, okay. Okay, here we go. Did Is you, that better? Do, do, you have, um, do you have in your hand the script for the instructions? Is that what you're... Uh, two sides to every story. Uh, well, actually, it's his history is that... Uh, I was invited to participate in an exhibition at the Walker Art Center mm -hmm. in in Minneapolis, and it, it was to be uh, film installations. So Two Sides to Every Story was first made f for that exhibition, and then subsequently uh, had uh, had other in installations, and, and uh, eventually the the National Gallery bought it. Okay. So it's uh, it's their their work, but uh, uh, the installation is pretty strict because uh, everything centers around uh, around the screen. Uh, uh, the screen is a, as thin as a screen can be. Mm -hmm. Like n normally, screens are seem to be part of the architecture. But in this case, that one of the protagonists in the, it, it is actually the screen itself. Mm -hmm. But the screen disappears in, in diff different ways uh, during the film. Uh, but it, and it's also at the center of the two cameras and cameramen mm -hmm. that, that shot the, the film. So they're, 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 they themselves are, are in, the, in the film sometimes. Mm -hmm. Uh, the th the th I think the thing is that uh, it's uh, w while it is <laughs> it is very thin and is is you know just a, just a moving image in space. Uh, I think once you're, you're you're watching it, you realize what's happening, which is that 
it's a kind of recto verso situation that what is on one side of the screen uh, is the front of what is on the other side of the screen or or the back you know so uh, the, the screen is, is is suspended and I think w once you've uh, you understand what's what's happening that it's actually both sides or, or two sides of whatever is, is happening in the center uh, this, this, the spectator will I think mostly people will start looking f from one side to the other mm -hmm. so it ends up being uh, asking for a fair bit of motion like uh, un, unlike a, a cinema situation right it's, it's fairly active uh, I mean, if, if, if you start sort of figuring out what it's doing. Yeah, it invites a kind of intimacy because you can get quite close to it and, yeah. uh, uh, and it doesn't uh, push you away, which I, yeah. I think is very so interesting. The, 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 the screen is made vis visible by uh, being, being painted on mm -hmm. and it's also cut mm -hmm. so that... Uh, the t two actors mm -hmm. go th through it from mm -hmm. one side to the other, mm -hmm. which is an interesting experience because I think you see the uh, the realism, uh, uh, how the re realism of the film image works, mm -hmm. because it, because it's uh, it, it is thir thoroughly two dimensional in fact, mm -hmm. and it's, it's just uh, cues that you get that make you read it as three dimensional. Mm -hmm. Uh, which of course started with with uh, the the Lumiere right. train. <laughs> yes, and that which brings us yeah. to yeah. it's an excellent segue. The train, uh, uh, Vera. I wanted to uh, ask you about mm -hmm. not just the origin of where uh, this work came from. It's the third of a trilogy, I know, and the blue train. Uh, but how if your it's in a different format than you have. Every one of your works is a different format, so I don't know why I would be surprised by that. But uh, the, would you talk about the, the decision to, to place it on different screens and how that, to make almost a book uh, of, the, uh, of, of, of the works, of each of the individual works, which are very compelling, each of them, Gosh, I hadn't thought of it as a book, but maybe mm -hmm. it will be. Mm -hmm. Eight artists were invited, Stan was one of them, to um, create works for the inaugural show at the Ryerson Image Center. Mm -hmm. And one of our uh, invitations was to consult a collection of photographs called the Black Star Collection of Documentary Photographs. It's an extraordinary collection, and Ryerson had just received it. And Peggy was reminding me, Peggy Gale, who was, I think, co-curating that exhibition with Doina Popescu. Is, is Doina here? Was that a yes? In trouble now. No, <laughs> never. <laughs> and Peggy reminded me that I was looking for uh, all kinds of images in the categories created for this collection, um, and I came across an image of a steam train, and it reminded me of the story that my mother told me many times of how she got me as an infant out of Czechoslovakia. One of the experiences that stayed with her was the fact that there were a number of, it turned out to be a Nazi troop train or at least some of the carriages, and there were Nazi soldiers, soldiers of the Third Reich, m moving up and down the train. And my mother was very blonde, and she said that it was the color of her hair and her eyes that probably saved us. And that is a story that, if you say that to a child, it's, it leaves a mark. So on the left hand, panel of the diptych that's anchoring these 32 tablets is the narrative of that journey. 
The right hand tablet of the diptych is a work about one of the photojournalists in the Black Star collection, Werner Wolf, and his return to Germany after the war. So though the war is never mentioned, it hovers between those two narratives, the 1939 narrative and the 1945 narrative. And for those of you that are very young, I'm talking about World War II. <laughs> the 32 separate stories that Lisa referred to are short one-minute narratives describing various other passengers on the same train. Does that answer your question? It's, um, uh, it seemed, I, don't, I'm not, I know that the transit bar is the, uh, the work that was selected for the 150. Um, this, if anyone who hasn't had an opportunity to see uh, the transit bar, it was uh, two years ago at the MOCA, yes, and um, it's a, a wonderful place to have a drink. Uh, and you can drink at the transit bar. Uh, but it's, a, it's an incredible installation. But uh, the inclusion of the blue train with, uh, to bring it here, it, I guess, as you have told me, the, uh, it, it wasn't available to the National Gallery somehow. Tiff asked for it and yeah. didn't get it. And also, uh, I learned last night, it's so important to go to your own opening. You find out mm -hmm. all kinds of things. The Cinémathèque Québécois uh, uh, asked for it. They wanted to install it. It's a multi-channel video installation and a functional piano bar. And uh, I don't play the piano, but I do serve the drinks. Yes. <laughs> and well. Um, but I think that the, the, the collusion of, uh, of Overture, Stan's uh, work, Overture, and the Blue Train uh, brings us into um, this, uh, the, the, the way in which I think memory, of course, uh, and uh, repetition uh, formulate, uh, are, are go together to construct uh, some, our, our way of getting through. Mm -hmm. uh, and that uh, the, the continuity of these, the continuity of the tunnels, uh, which I think is, is, um, is quite wonderful between the, the works, as, as they, those two works in particular, how they speak to each other. Um, but uh, Stan, I wanted to, s to ask you um, about uh, the, 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 the text from uh, In Search of Lost Time, the Proust text that is um, the piece um, about sleep and coming in and out of consciousness and the, the, say, the impression that lay like scales upon my eyes, uh, preventing sight. And I think that, that, is, uh, that as an introduction to the whole work, which it, which it is, it's in Swan's way, um, the, it's, it, that really speaks to the, the narrator's ability to uh, to exist both in consciousness and just on the on the on the the verge of it, just on the the horizon. Maybe not conscious, but certainly not unconscious. And um, I wanted to ask you, how did you choose? I mean, how how did you have how did you have the nerve to use that text? <laughs> Well, the work is really a synthesis of two big books. Mm -hmm. One is in, is in Search of Lost Time by Marcel Proust. Other is the um, panoramic view of uh, Kicking Horse Canyon by the Edison Film Company, mm -hmm. which is part of the um, uh, Library of Congress's uh, paper negative connection. Before they had um, stable uh, um, film, it was on a material that would be very flammable. In fact, projectionists would have to have um, fireman tickets to, to do their job. Um, so in order to incorporate a film and to store it, they had to photograph every frame of a film onto a page of a book. So in order to re make, make this film, they had to re-photograph the pages from those, those films to make an uh, interpositive. Um, so I found it kind of like, interesting that we have, I'm putting two books together to make this one uh, audio, audio visual work. <coughs> but in a way, it was, I hadn't read uh, Proust's book at that, that point, but I had read Beckett's uh, essay on, on Proust. Mm -hmm. um, I read Proust later, but I, I did, couldn't finish it. I sort of got to the last 10 pages and stopped for some reason. <laughs> I didn't want, it to, didn't want it to end, so I, I wouldn't, wouldn't end it. Um, but in that introduction, he lays out the concepts which will be the engine that drives the entire book and in a way 
uh, Proust's career and, and Beckett's career uh, philosophically, and that's to do with the ideas of habit and involuntary memory. Mm -hmm. uh, involuntary memory as opposed to voluntary memory is something which is very human, uh, something you can't control. It's like um, uh, the difference between a, a vice and an orgasm. It's something which is like something that's spontaneous. Um, and habit is the thing which Beckett said is the, um, the ballast which changed the dog to its vomit. I still don't know what that means, but it's, uh, habit is the thing which allows us to make uh, sense of the world, uh, for everything to, co to, hear, to cohere, not to be um, sort of shocked by the strangeness of it all. So Proust in this condition of being half awake, half asleep, not knowing where he was, not knowing who he was, this is in a way a possibility at any moment of our lives. But habit is the thing which then um, kind of brings us back to our, our sense of identity and our sense of what the world is. But the strangeness of the world, the strangeness of other people is a constant companion to us and that's kind of the um, uh, sort of a major theme of that work. But my work was more about, was less about that than it was also about um, the problem of humans and machines. Mm -hmm. How do we understand the world, or how has the, the world, of our, the world uh, changed to us now that we get so much of our information in the world from mechanical media? Uh, and this is why you see a machine's point of view of a machine going through a, the, the Rocky Mountain through mm -hmm. a landscape. In a way, it's the inverse of arrival of the train to the station. We're not being, the audience being shocked by the train, we are the train. Um, so what does this mean when we identify uh, with the machine? And that's a question which uh, would preoccupy, preoccupy me for much of my career, and that's why I call it overture, both because it's the overture to the Proust novel, but also the overture to things I would uh, be doing for many years to come. Did you know that at the time? I, I did, yeah. No, I, I, knew, okay. I thought I was trying to look for something that I could do that could be a productive okay. practice, and I thought, okay, this is something I really don't understand, and this is something which I can explore for a long time. Congratulations. That's fantastic. <laughs> that is a great story. No, I... I, um, I wonder, um, Michael, I, I, I want to quote you now because um, of something you said at the power plant a few years ago when you had your exhibition, and I wanted to speak, maybe uh, all three of you might discuss what is the essential, now you make installations, all of you. Um, you also have been known to, uh, to show uh, what, are, what are referred to as single channel works, single projections, um, um, uh, works uh, that are solo works on either a video monitor in the old days or a projected uh, uh, work in a cinema. What's the difference between the cinema, and I want to let you, uh, t I want to quote you, Michael, and see, tell me if I'm misquoting you, but you said that the, uh, in the gallery, um, you, you had a very small, uh, um, you could only get a small commitment often from the viewer. And whereas you had, uh, in the theater, you have a contract with the viewer. And I thought that was such an interesting um, differentiation. Um, and uh, the, the, do you, s did you say that? Yeah. Did I? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Something yes, like that? Yes, I really try to work for the, 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 the context, and I think the cinema is a traditional theater situation mm -hmm. uh, where there's an expectation, people come uh, with the expectation that they, they will stay for, for, for a certain amount of time at mm -hmm. least. Uh, you know, so one tries to work for that in some, some senses, but working in, in a gallery context, is the you, you know that the audience, or, or even potential audience, is ambulatory. Mm -hmm. They're 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 walking around, and so we. Uh, there's only in certain circumstances where th that you can expect that someone might stay for for a certain amount of time. Uh, so it's not that you you make something that that should be will, will be over in a very short time, but you have to consider that uh, making something where if someone saw five or ten minutes, they might find something of, 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 mm -hmm. of some strength. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and, and inevitably it will be different from what you might do for cinema. But of course there are so many screens now. Uh, mm -hmm. th this is a kind of old-fashioned attitude, I suppose. Yeah. yeah. But I, but I do uh, work for the for the, the the context, and two sides, which is in the exhibition here, is an installation. It, it's not cinema at all. So, 
uh, it, it's, it's made to be, to be seen as an installation which you walk around. I'm so trying to get an image up here. Moving, moving image I'm installation. Yeah. Am I doing the wrong thing? I'm pointing it the wrong way. The green one. Oh, green. Okay. All right. Uh, this is uh, this is uh, overture. This is Stan's work that we spoke about. Paper negatives. I'd forgotten that part. This is uh, uh, the transit bar, Vera Frankel's work, and blue train installation. And then I want to get to Michael's. There. This is uh, two sides to every story. And that's the to here she's spraying on one side and here oops how do I go back uh, the red one okay gotcha. nothing works it's me okay great thank you <laughs> so <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, our, our position is not too favorable, not, but I think I've seen it before. So. It's, it's, less, it's less than ideal. You're quite right, Michael. But um, I wanted to, just for reference purposes, I think, too, uh, so people could, uh, uh, could reference what you're talking about somewhat. But I think the, the, um, the, 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 certainly with this work, you really do take into account, you encourage uh, the circulation of your viewer, you don't just try to fight against it, but you, in, you incur, actively encourage them to, yes. as you say, they're ambulatory, they're, yeah. they're moving around. This is a, a, a good example in some ways because uh, this woman starts to spray into the air essentially because there's nothing, you don't see anything there. And uh, in fact, there is a, a, a clear plastic there. So she, and she spray paints a, 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 a circle and the thing is that you you can see that from both sides and uh, uh, you, if, when you move around you see, you, 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 mm -hmm. you, you, you see the same thing uh, and, and and then when when the circle is complete she steps aside and uh, the, uh, a man cuts the, the 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 image and and ste steps through it so they, they and, and then she steps through it, the, the hole that was made, and goes to the other side right. too. So th this is all uh, depending on where you're standing. You get very very different readings of three dimensionality and of two dimensionality mm -hmm. because, as I said, in, in fact the image is of, of two dimensions, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and in a way it's our, our our own reading that gives it three dimensions. So there's a kind of, uh, I think, an unusual experience of seeing uh, the the realism of the image uh, appear as you're watching it. <coughs> Especially when the green circle is made, for sure, that yeah. becomes almost a sort of uh, a bit of magic because it is being sprayed into air. Yeah, Vera, I wanted you to uh, tell us a little bit about. Uh, your strategies uh, around uh, th this, because you've made a number of installations, but what's the difference between the installation, um, the, the, uh, the properties that go into an installation that are different from a single channel work that might be shown in a theater or in a festival? Well, there's an awareness of the space mm -hmm. for which it is designed. And as Michael says, the ambulatory nature of the viewer, I like the idea of creating a bond with the viewer that isn't a contract, that the work itself invites. Mm -hmm. And I also don't require the viewer to know everything about a piece. I think they should take from it what's useful and interesting and perhaps come back and see it another time. What has always surprised me, most recently at the AGO, also here downstairs, is um, the AGO, I installed a work called Frightened Desires or the Making of a Pornographer, which was about a 
an idealistic filmmaker who wanted to make a film on the life cycle of the flea. And the life cycle of the flea offended our provincial chief censor, and she insisted the fleas have costumes. <laughs> I won't tell you the whole story, but it's an anti-censorship work that was first made in 1985 to oppose some of the um, invasions, also into, I, I think, Ramo's nephew. You were asked to censor a passage from Ramo's nephew by that chief censor. This was in 1984. But the work that was installed at the AGO was totally different from the original work that I'd been asked to uh, produce in that space. It was both the space and it was also the policy of the institution, because the original work was a slide sound installation, and we were midway to installing it when we learned that the AGO doesn't do slides anymore. So the artist has to respond to circumstance, mm -hmm. and I had to transform the work to suit that circumstance. I was tempted to walk away, but the people that I was working with more closely, the people close to the ground, the curators and the installers, were wonderful, so the administrators got their way. Well, it's, uh, uh, it was a wonderful installation, too. Um, Stan, what uh, about you? What's the, because your works are, take sometimes incredible uh, amounts of, uh, of, of, of te technique and technology in order to, to complete the installation. Um, I know how difficult uh, uh, Detroit, the, uh, the 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 work you did in Detroit was, which I saw there, uh, in, uh, and was remarkable work. Um. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, these are <coughs> cinematic installations, and um, as such, they don't work like cinema. They don't work with the idea of um, <coughs> the audience sharing the perspective of the camera. You're not being, you're not being disciplined to sit in a chair, mm -hmm. look forward, mm -hmm. don't talk. Mm -hmm. um, you, in a way, complete the work with your body. Uh, you can complete the montage with your body, but deciding how you look at it, where you look at it, um, and for how, how, how long. Um, I kind of solved a problem when I made Overture that I, I for, forgot for a number of years, but remembered again <coughs> when I made a film called The Sandman. Um, mm -hmm. And that is that if you're working in a gallery, people don't come in at the beginning and don't leave at the end. Mm -hmm. um, and this piece in Overture, um, everything is kind of uh, in media res. It's, everything's in the middle. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't matter when you walk in, doesn't matter when you walk out, you can watch it twice, you can watch it three times. And in, in fact, there's actually internal repetitions as well in the piece. Uh, there's only three pieces of film, but there's six voiceovers. So um, because the voiceover is slightly different, but also shares many similarities, you may think you've heard, seen the section before, but you actually haven't. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a confusion which maybe will keep the audience there longer, but also give them the same experience of confusion as to, is this reality, is this not, that the narrator is having as well. And also, a thing which I reinstated in this piece, which I had taken away for a number of years, what it's showing here, is that I don't use a screen anymore, I just use the wall. Um, so the idea was, which I really loved early on, which I forgot about it as well, um, is that there's a moment when the image goes away, and for a brief instance, you, th you realize you're looking at a blank wall. You're not mm -hmm. looking at a, at a window into a different world. But when the image comes back again, and you c come out of the tunnel, you're, in, you're confiscated by that, that world again. So this interplay between um, uh, depiction and materiality is something that is key to the work as well. And key to almost all cinematic graphic works where um, the, the thingness of the, of the image and the, the uh, concreteness of your body uh, is a thing which completes the work. Yeah. I wonder if, um, if you, each of you wanted to uh, talk a little bit about what you're doing at this stage? I mean, before we open it up for, for, for questions, uh, what's the, Vera, you had a, you're working on uh, some new work that sounds unbelievably like a Vera Frankel piece. Uh, I know. What, how does it go? Um, on the nature of personhood, flute and drum, unheard. It's a work about well, it, it's in two forms, a seven-channel installation and a single-channel work, both, 
featuring encounters between very, very young children and adults over 75, between children and elders. We were talking about it the other night a bit. Um, Stan was kind enough to ask and then maybe regretted asking about my current work. <laughs> what generated it was an awareness that children aren't taken seriously and neither are old people. And I found that in filming their confrontations, and they didn't know each other in advance, the conversations were quite extraordinary. And part of the work involves a game of chance that I designed that has them choosing cards, each with its single word on the back, and they then made images, both the children and the elders. And I can't say much else because I'm in the middle of editing it, but those are, that's the beginning of the work. And Flute and Drum, as a title, the children connoted to me the voice of the flute and the depth of the drum was to connote the elders. Michael. Me? Yes. <laughs> you're on. You're on. Um, well, I, I'm w working on uh, negotiations that are, well, I, actually it's exchanges of emails with the curator at the Guggenheim in the Bil Bil Bilbao. Okay. And I'm going to have a show there of, of sculpture, which will re relate a little bit to a, a, a show of sculpture I had at the AGO uh -huh. two years ago. Uh -huh. Uh, mostly work that, that that I sort of sum up by call, saying that it's it's the work itself is involved in directing one's vi the vision, vision of the spectator. Yeah. So anyway, this is a wonderful new place to place to exhibit, yes. and I'm very happy about that. Yeah. Um, that's another great thing news. that's kind of <laughs> will be uh, is surprising to me still but it'll probably be surprising to everybody here, but I've been commissioned to compose s something for the Winnipeg Symphony, that is, a symphony. Oh, fantastic. And uh, <laughs> just between you and me, I can't do it, but I've, I've, I've agreed. <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> um, and uh, a group that I played with uh, on a tour in Tokyo with uh, Aki Onda, Alan Licht, and myself, uh, which is an electronic trio, uh, where there is a, a, a Japanese company putting out a, a, an LP of the concerts that we played, and I'm des designing the jacket for that. Fantastic! Wow. Uh, I'm starting to think of things that are things that are happening. Well, it's uh, it's uh, <laughs> that's that's quite a bit. A symphony is quite a bit. <laughs> and, uh, and the, the, there's the show at. Uh, at, uh, what's the gallery called? <laughs> the, the, uh, oh, prefix. Uh, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Actually, my time is spent a, a, a lot to do with the emails. There are a number of in interviews that are going on with somebody okay. in, Sp in Spain right mm -hmm. now, okay. uh, and uh, so. Are you sure, you're working hard enough. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the space of uh, of Bilbao, <laughs> the space of Bilbao, I've heard is very challenging. I've never seen it. I've, I have never been there, but no, it's supposed there. to be very challenging, uh, and supposedly only uh, Richard Serra's work looks good in it. So I want you to give him a run for it. But I think the sculpture—that's wonderful news. Uh, I'm not sure if people got a chance and opportunity to see the uh, um, the uh, uh, exhibition of your sculptural works that were a total—I don't know why—but they were a total surprise to uh, to uh, both Kim and I when we went to see the exhibition when it was uh, at the AGO, and uh, the focusing of vision I think was so clear, uh, clearly articulated with the materials, with the placement of the body. And uh, uh, I think that'll be wonderful. It's wonderful that the work will, will uh, again be a, on an exhibition in Bill uh, uh like an amazing... This one is about a year away. Okay. Uh, actually, another thing that I'm working on is called Early Snow. 
and it's for the Hamilton Art Gallery. It's a retrospective of my work starting in the 50s to 61. Okay. F 51 to 61. Okay. Uh, which is a kind of... Uh, and there's there's actually a, a, a book being written okay. about those year about that period. Okay. It's so, mostly painting. Yeah. So stay tuned. In other words, <laughs> which I, I I haven't painted for a long time, so, <laughs> so I'll have to, have re to. refresh my memory. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for questions like this, uh, Stan, you yourself. Um, I've, I have had bad luck when I say what I'm doing. Okay. Uh, when I, once I did that, <clears throat> I talked about a piece uh, in 2008. I was I thought I was making in 2008, but I, for various reasons, could not make it until uh, 2016. So. Um, <laughs> Okay. But one thing that's almost done is a series of photographs of um, the UK riots from 2011. Um, I was always kind of fascinated by that year because it was a year of riots. You had um, the Arab Spring was, was ongoing. Right. You had Occupy. Um, you had hockey riots in Vancouver. <coughs> and you had riots beginning in Tottenham, which was a sort of traditional race riot. But then also it spread throughout the city to Hackney and elsewhere, uh, which became something other, more of a economic uh, riot, and then it spread to other cities such as uh, uh, Manchester and Liverpool. Um, so what I did is I, I licensed some f uh, footage from Sky News, aerial footage mm -hmm. of the riots, and I thought I could use that to do some photogrammetry, which is where you take uh, multiple photographs around an object and infer a 3D model, and then I could use that to make a, a photograph documenting the psychogeography of the, of the riot. But um, it you know, turned out there were all kinds of holes and it was w just too low res, so what I did is last fall I went back to where the um, shots were taken in a helicopter and made a very high-res plate shot with a uh, 100 megapixel camera. And then um, what I'm doing now is pasting in uh, scenes from the riots from the video footage that's uh, quite high resolution when it's at that scale that zoomed all the way in to reconstruct uh, a view of the riot you could never see. So there's two visions, one by uh, one sort of on a high street, Mare Street, and one by a big um, a uh, housing project called the Pembury Estate. And there's lots of you know, horses and fires and burning cars and uh, riot police and all that good stuff. Yeah, you <laughs> like a good riot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I know that, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. It's, it sounds amazing. So, uh, and it's, w its format will be a photograph? There's two photographs, one is uh, six by eight and one is uh, five by 10. Um, and yeah, I, I've, start to hire some additional people um, to work on it. It'll take about four months to do yeah. those two photographs. Yeah. yeah, I can only imagine, yeah. Incredible. Where um, will they be shown? Uh, in London, uh, in, Oct uh, in October. Mm -hmm. I think we're about, re are we ready for the, if, are we there? I, I'm thinking, one of the questions which um, I didn't um, ask uh, that uh, that had been suggested to me, and m maybe I won't come back to it just briefly, and, as and ask each of you about uh, the initial re uh, response to this work, to uh, in, to overture, to blue train, uh, and and to st st why at two sides to every story. Two sides to every story. I want to say every story has two sides. I don't know why, so my apology. But do you, what, what was the initial response? How did? It's very hard to answer that. I think the first time it was shown, I think it was, it was well received. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I was there at the opening, and I saw it for several times. Uh, but, I th but I th there's really no way to pr properly answer that because uh, sometimes you don't hear anything back anyway. So right, right, right. Uh, what he said. Sorry. <laughs> okay, right. I know it's a it, it's a funny one. But or as Vera said, unless unless there was a riot. Uh, my experience with my work is always people coming and saying, "Can this be true? <laughs> yeah, is this really true?" because a lot of my work hovers between documentary and fiction. So I'm often engaged in conversation, and depending on how much truth I want to tell, 
at that point. Uh, we talk about the work mm -hmm. and often about the experiences of the viewer. Mm -hmm. Vera has asked that uh, there be, uh, that she will have access to the recording of this material, so it could, in fact, end up in her next piece, so we don't know. Uh, that's, that's uh, so to everybody, we all sign waivers for Vera now? Well, we've all been asked to sign waivers for TIFF. <laughs> I'm the only one that says, so far, as far as I know, that I want the same privileges as the host. <laughs> All right, I think we can open it up now, and I would ask uh, that people use, uh, because of the recording, that you use the microphone. Hello? Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you to all three of the speakers. Really interesting uh, discussion so far. Uh, I have a question for Stan uh, Douglas. So you mentioned in your first remarks that you're interested in our relationship to machines, and I just kind of want to dig deeper. Um, when you speak about machines, what do you mean? I think it's sort of maybe an ambiguous term. Are we speaking about computers? Are we speaking about a simple input-output? Are we speaking about artificial intelligence, something that could one day become you know, a, a sentient being, that a robot that overtakes the human race? Um, I think it's an important question to consider, and if you can maybe just define what you mean uh, about a machine in, in your own work and how you think that relates to our own you know, consciousness and maybe the consciousness of machines in the future. Sure. I definitely don't mean robots or artificial intelligence, um, but I just mean uh, technical re reproduction, things which mimic the senses in some way and that we somehow will mistake for our senses. Um, <clears throat> There's a story of something called the Black Mirror, or, or the uh, uh, Claude Glass, where in the 18th century, people who were fans of Claude Lorraine, this uh, French painter who introduced the idea of pictorialism, or the picturesque rather, um, they would go out in the, into, the, the, into the nature and look for scenes that resembled their idea of what a, a painting should look like, or a painted scene should look like. They would turn their back to it and look at the reflection in a black mirror, uh, which kind of like took out the detail and made it more contrasty. So they had this desire somehow to uh, see the world as an optical image, as opposed to seeing it as, it, as they do as a human. Because uh, we see in fragments, we see in little bits and pieces, only this much of our eye is in focus. Everything else is a very complex array of um, parallel processing, to use a mechanical metaphor, of um, pattern recognition, um, color recognition, and lo long and short-term memory. Like, I, I know what Vera's dress looks like, but I don't have to look at it to know what it looks like. And, it, and I, I know it's still there, only though I'm seeing it in my peripheral vision. That's part of how we, we see through how we think. <clears throat> we don't see in a gestalt like a photograph, um, but people often think that they do, they do see photographs, but it's not like that at all. We see through meaning. Uh, a guy named Frederick Kittler, who's a, a media theorist, German media theorist, um, said that nobody ever described their life passing before their eyes until the idea of the, um, uh, the montage in cinema was perfected. So people began describing their dreams in terms of montage, which was uh, a mechanical thing. So, these mechanical ways of seeing the world and depicting the world infect our visions of the world. And that's <coughs> the problem I've, I've been considering. Like, how do, we, uh, how do we break that? How do we get away from that? How do we find cracks in that? And how do we find something which is more human and a human possibility that, that's not uh, as um, restrictive as, as these things are? <coughs> For example, VR, which they talk about giving you freedom, in a way, restricts you. It, it reduces all your senses to one and you're in the center, you're immobile. If you do move, you're, you're being moved by something other than yourself. Um, so in a way, this, the freedom that had been, I mean, often there's this metaphor of uh, perspective being uh, the visual pr uh, metaphor of uh, imperialism where you, you appropriate a landscape to a central gaze, to a central point. Um, VR, 360 VR kind of takes us to a large extreme, but what it's doing is taking the viewer and, and, and sort of enclosing them in something as opposed to them the viewer being the imperialist who appropriates something from the outside, the viewer is being appropriated by something which is able to, which produces the VR technology. So all, all these things infect our imaginations, and I think these are problems which are ongoing. Other questions? Yes, um, that's a very interesting comment. So a uh, question for Michael and also Stan. Um, because uh, Stan, you were just talking about VR and that's a very interesting um, um, observation about it. 
And I was wondering if Michael has has cons what if he can speak about the relationship of um, both sides of the story to VR? Because I was thinking in a description of it, it's exactly the reverse of VR, where the screen is in the center and um, the audience can, they have agency to, to, to walk around the screen and, um, and the cameras are, are um, outside pointing in. In VR, the cameras are inside pointing out. And um, I, I, I just found uh, it's a it's um it's a, a a very kind of essential uh, a piece about the cinema experience, and um, I, um, I just wondered if if um, either of you could have any thoughts about about that. I don't know if um i i i can i'm a, I'm thinking some things uh, to say about two sides to every story, but I'm not sure that they're relevant to the way the way you just a, a, approached it uh, uh I think the the inside outside is a, sort of a, a factor in in that in in the film you see the the two cameras and cameramen that are making what you're looking at and um, that's affected on both sides uh, for example there there there's a part at the end, well, it doesn't matter whether it's at the end, but uh, where uh, we, I put uh, transparent plastics in front of the, the lens of one of the, one, of, one of the cameras. Well, that changes the image, but it doesn't change the image that you're looking at, it changes the other image. You know, so there's a kind of a, 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 a exchanging of, uh, of the, what, what's being produced uh, and being Recorded at the same time, uh, when it's <laughs> when it's played back, uh, it, the source now is the, is the two projectors which, which are placed where the uh, uh, camera cameras that took that made the film uh, were physically. I mean, in in, in uh, distance, you know. So. Um, is that relevant? It is. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I guess the fundamental difference is that um, uh, Michael's film is dialogical, whereas uh, VR or uh, panoramas are, are uh, monological. Panorama takes the logic of the um, perspective cone to its conclusion, where not just being one vanishing point, which is the, I guess, the bourgeois subject, but it, it surrounds them and, and, and makes them uh, the center of all, all everything that's visible. Um, so there's always just one point of view in a, in a panorama or in a, in a perspective painting. Uh, but in Michael's piece, there's actually two vanishing points in opposite sides. And the thing which, which VR and all these things kind of forget is that there's not only one subject, there are two subjects, multiple subjects, there's the other. So in a way, Michael's film suggests the possibility of the other in a cinematic experience that's otherwise denied. Other, um, I th just well, if you have a few more minutes, uh, we, uh, you can compose a question. But I wanted uh, to uh, come back, I think, to uh, the notion of what you're talking about this, uh, the, the the placement of the of of the of the, the the viewer in relation to the artworks. In this case, I think there um, there there's a circulation. There's um, I think in overture, you you've place the the viewer in 
almost a traditional uh, relationship with, with the screen, uh, but by when you deprive us of, uh, when we go into the tunnel, um, we're, we're a little bit lost in, in, in that way. And I think that that, um, the, that feeling, that sense of, of, of discontinuity is happening in each one of these pieces. Uh, the, 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 the rupture in stories, the, the uh, Vera in uh, Blue Train, I think, is remarkable. The letters that are started and not finished, and we just never know what comes. We don't know the end. We don't know what happened uh, w with it. And I think, Michael, it's a very, um, it's a, a quite a different sense of that we don't of what we don't know. But it's a quite a confounding piece because you're right. The 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 the, um, the transparent uh, part is is quite funny because you're thinking something's going to happen that doesn't happen. And so I, I'm just the relationship to the viewer and the way in which the viewer is never, um, it's, not, it, 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 it's not that they're not pandered to, they're not fulfilled. There's a quest, it seems to me. There's a constant kind of almost an argument in each of these pieces that, that is, as if you were going to, if you were going to try to uh, to comprehend, to think about beauty, to think about any of the things, to think about uh, philosophical uh, questions, any of the things that we might think about in relation to, you know, great art or whatever, none of the three of you allow that to happen. You just, you know, get the hat pin out and you know, give us a good goose when we can't, you know, uh, it's it's. It's quite remarkable, all three of these pieces, and I think that I'd like you to speak about that. I guess from my perspective, the, um, the work happens in the tunnels. The work happens mm -hmm. in the negative space. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the key thing. It's like montage in cinema where, um, montage is where the, the viewer makes the film happen. Uh, it's the cut between one shot and another, that is a change of perspective from one person to another, or one place to another, one time and another. That isn't, that's not shown on the screen, it happens in the viewer's head. Mm -hmm. Like uh, cinema always, people always say it's like cinema is a bunch of photographs in a row. No, uh, cinema is the impression of motion between frames and the impression of sense and time between shots. Uh, it's something else entirely. So, I mean, these could be, like in, in Kubrick's 2001, there's a cut between a bone and a spaceship. So the entirety of human history is, is contained in that negative space. Um, so in, in my film, I, I think the most productive part is that confusion when you're not seeing an image which assures you of what you're looking at, but you're in that in-between space where you're not sure if you're just looking at the space you're in or if you're looking at a window to a different world. Mm -hmm. And I think the, 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 and will you come out of it again? And it surprised me this time seeing the piece again, how I, yeah, how I got tricked back into it every time of will it, is there, oh, is this, does this go to black now? Does it just d drift away for a while and then come back? But it's this constant um, in and out of the tunnels that I think is, uh, does that. Vera, what about Blue Train, Ned? Well, I think there's a difference between closure and satisfaction in an artwork. Mm -hmm. And, and I, th I think uncertainty is, is, is sometimes essential to experiencing a work and allowing the viewer, allowing him or herself to not know everything. I think that that is kind of important. So if that is what you mean by mm -hmm. the hat pin, mm -hmm. I had to think twice about what that item might be, because most of us have never seen one. <laughs> um, I liked very much what Stan said earlier about when you said you are the train, when you're mm -hmm. experiencing that work. So it, it, it gives us an experience that we wouldn't otherwise have had. And the fact that we can, for all the reasons you've described, create the continuity out of the discontinuity, there's something very healing about that. And um, it's only possible when a work is, in a sense, incomplete, in, in the sense that you were describing. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I think it's the incompleteness that um, makes us, uh, that develops, um, I, I, I would use the word longing. 
I think there's a kind of a, but not a longing in, um, um, not in, a not, a, not in a sentimental way, but a, um, a, a longing to, uh, to be able to, uh, to answer the argument, you know, the, um, in, in purely, you know, platonic sense, like to want to, to have the discussion that will lead to the answer to that, but that answer just isn't coming. Mm -hmm. And I think because of the territory that you, your territory, that where your works are located, this particularly this trilogy, are in real places, and real things happened, and real people died, and real people did bad things, and uh, real people lived and survived, and um, so there's. But it's within that urgency. There's there's no sense. Uh, you don't create that. Um, it's it's not uh, as you say. It's not sentimental, and it's not. Uh, they, they're just it, these stories are there, and they can't be undone. They can't go away. They can't be resolved. There's not a, and I, I think that's really quite remarkable. I, um, and I, I it really enjoyed the, the experience of, of, the, of the work again. Really enjoyed it. But I do think maybe it is a book. I don't know. Mm -hmm. yeah, in a way. A maybe it is a book. A book? I don't know. <laughs> also, <laughs> okay. I don't know. <laughs> it, it could just be the format. But um, Michael, yourself, I mean, in, in that, uh, uh, the, the leaving what you leave out, what you incorporate, what you... Uh. Uh, I was just thinking that uh, every film is history in some way, but Stan and Vera's films are history, and two sides is present tense in some strange way. Uh, does that make any sen sense at all? <laughs> yes, it does. <laughs> you had longer hair then. <laughs> <laughs> in the present. Yes. In that present. Ah, oh, there's a question? Yes. Hi. Hi. Um, this is a question for all of you, but uh, is in response to Stan um, and your first comment in particular. Um, when you commented about um, this need to search for that human bit through your work um, and the way that we've sort of been trained to see the world, um, montages through dreams and th dreams through montages, um, what are you looking for in particular when you talk about looking for a human? And how do you know when you've found it? <coughs> Again, it's the, where our perception uh, exceeds the, what could be represented by technical media. And typically what I'm doing is trying to break whatever is the um, uh, mm -hmm. con conventional behavior of, of, of the machine, of the device, um, to find out what the conventions are and to uh, make an either an alternative convention or to find something that... Uh, it requires something that the uh, convention cannot provide, or the te technology can, cannot provide. Um, but getting a hint of that through um, showing where that that excess uh, excess is, um, but never forgetting that it's we're not we we can't identify with the machine's perspective or the te technical image's uh, point of view. It always has some way in which it will interfere with that. It's much like taking the, this idea of the hot and cold medium uh, to an extreme. The, the McLuhan often do is do be as theoretical concepts, but this idea of the hot medium and the cool medium. Hot medium, it's kind of reversed today, but hot medium, when he was writing, was cinema, which was high resolution, lots of detail. A cool medium was uh, television, because it was low resolution and fuzzy. So because there's this veil of, of haze between you and the image, you do have to do some work to, to make that happen. You had to sort of like if infer or project into the image to make it uh, legible in some way. Whereas with film, it just presents it to you. And now those who are nostalgic for film are talking about how cold uh, uh, HD video is, 4K video is. There's mm -hmm. too much information. It hasn't got grain, it hasn't got noise, it doesn't move around, there's no dust. So these things that are, are we're now nostalgic for film having the uh, impediments to transparency that uh, uh, we're getting now with these other medium. But typically on a, on a different scale and in a different method altogether, I'm interested in taking these technologies and trying to find a way to break them. Which you did when you de-interlaced uh, this. Uh, Nutka? N Nutka, right. yeah. yeah. Or put different images on the 
uh, different rasters. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Vera. I'm usually motivated by the human to start with, and I'm of a generation that had to fight to include narrative in my work. It was considered bad form. Um, real art was very abstract, and there were no words necessary. And if you used words, it was a sign of, of weakness, and I have too much respect for the word to have believed that. So I'd like to think that most of my works, and if we're talking about this trilogy of which the Blue Train is the culminating work uh, that started with the transit bar and then with Body Missing and now the Blue Train, they're all rooted in either personal history or world history, as Michael says. And I love the idea that you're in a perpetual present. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> and I'm happy. And, and the contract that we were asked to sign gives Tiff r rights. I can't think of all the words because it's, it's poetry of a kind. But maybe Amy can remember. In perpetuity, we've signed the right for the video of this panel. And in all universes, <laughs> so we can find ourselves on Mars, and Michael will be in the perpetual present, and you will be challenging the control of the machine, and I'll be dealing with narrative. Doesn't get much better than that, all right? <laughs> um, have we, did we answer it? Did they answer it? Yeah? But do, do you want to, uh, uh, more? You okay? <laughs> One last burning question? I have a last burning question. Okay. Why are they closing the gallery? Uh-huh, wow. uh-huh, good question. <laughs> yes. Um, the debate between and we are in, uh, players in that drama, between contemporary art and film is just getting really, really interesting. And having a gallery that allows evidence of that debate makes a lot of sense to me. So if anyone in the audience is interested in saving the gallery or renewing it, it would be a good time to write to the chairman of the board. Her name is Jennifer. <laughs> I don't know her family name, but I'm sure you can find out. Yes, I really second what you're saying. I think it should be the decision, if there is a decision, should be ob objected to, because what, what was going on is, is so valuable. And it, it must be affordable. There, there must be a way to, to I, mean, I, I don't know whether money was an excuse, but. It was uh, one of the excuses. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure that could be figured out. Here, here. Mm -hmm. On that note, I think I think we've exhausted everybody. I think we have. We have. I want to thank all three of you for being very good sports. I have been a um, I have been an absent moderator who didn't provide co communication, and you guys are all so smart. You were able to, of course, do a fine job. So I'm. Uh, Thank you. Thank you.